בא לי להפסיק דיבור? אפשר בעברית? אז אנחנו שמחים מאוד לארח היום את ידיד. אה, שנייה? אוקיי. So we are very excited to have ידיד here with us today. ידיד did his bachelor and master's in Oxford, starting at the age of 15, right? Then he went on to do his PhD in the Imbri University, and a postdoc at Facebook. And he's now at Facebook New York, and now he is in, uh, he's, a, he's a researcher in Facebook here. Um, so thank you, Amit. Um, so today I'm going to speak about unsupervised analogies. Um, so humans are really good at making analogies, even without any supervision. So for example, if we take a look at these three images, I think most of us would agree that the image um, in the middle is more analogous to the one on the right, right hand side than to the one on the left hand side. Um, so we weren't specifically trained to do it, we didn't receive specific supervision, but we can still make these analogies. So um, the objective of this talk is to be able to um, allow computers to make unsupervised analogies. The type of computational setting that we deal with um, in these works um, is, um, so we basically have um, two unordered sets of data. Um, one set has, uh, for example, in this case, uh, one of them has images of shoes, and um, the other set has edge maps of, uh, of also of shoes. Now, we don't have any correspondences between the two. We don't know of any. So this is an unsupervised setting. So there are two tasks that we're going to deal with in this set of works. The first one is unsupervised mapping. So for every image in one domain, our objective is to be able to synthesize another image in the other domain that preserves its semantic content. For example, in this case, um, we want um, to be able to synthesize um, a photorealistic image of a shoe that preserves the same edge map. The other task that we're going to deal with is matching. That is to say that for every um, image or every word X in one domain, we want to um, be able to retrieve um, the most analogous word in the other domain. Um, now, if we had supervision, most of the, both of these tasks wouldn't be very, very difficult. One of them would just be supervised regression. The other one would just be supervised metric learning. However, um, we don't have any supervision, which makes these tasks very challenging. More generally, um, analogies are defined as a special kind of similarity and it's about finding common patterns of relationships, even though the elements themselves might differ. Um, Holyoke and Thagard say in their book that analogical thinking lies at the core of human creativity. Um, so to be able to understand what uh, the previous art does, um, so let's um, first briefly overview adversarial methods. Um, so um, let's first review domain discriminators. So the goal is to be able to um, determine if a certain image belongs to a specific image domain. So more concretely, for example, we could ask the question of, does this image contain a natural image of a shoe or not? Um, so one solution uh, for solving this would be to train a deep discriminator so that it would be able to say whether a certain image contains a shoe or it doesn't. The way that we would train it is we would have a certain number of images of shoes and another set of number, uh, and another images of um, things that are not shoes, um, and we would train a deep function to discriminate between the two. So now that we have a deep discriminator like this, uh, so we could now train a domain mapping network to map between one domain and another one without supervision. The way we could go about doing something like this is to train a mapping network to take every image from some other domain and map it into another image that the discriminator would think that it come from, say, the shoe domain. So now, this may sound like um, a sensible idea, but in fact, it doesn't really work. Um, and so the reason is um, that the mapping function could be quite adversarial. What mean, we mean by this is that if we take, um, say, this image, which the classifier can easily say that it's an image of a panda, and then we train a function to try to fool the discriminator, the fool the classifier, then it would add some um, small amount of noise. When we add it to the image, we would not be able to see that the image is any different. But in fact, it would now classify this panda as a given. Um, so uh, just more generally, um, the discriminator would not uh, be able to cover the whole space of images. And so once the image is slightly out of distribution, um, it would not actually be effective. 
So Goodfellow et al. has suggested, uh, they proposed a method called adversarial training. Basically, the idea is to simultaneously train both the discriminator and the mapping function. The way this would work is we would train two things at the same time. Um, the first one is a mapping function that would try to um, map images. So the first one would be the discriminator. It would try to discriminate between images that are mapped into um, the target domain and images that are originally from the target domain. The um, other function would be the mapping function. And the mapping function would try to uh, fool the discriminator and map images so closely to the uh, target domain that the discriminator would not be able to distinguish the two. By training both at the same time, uh, we would be able to get finer and finer mappings. And hopefully, by the end of training, we would be able to map images so closely to the target domain that no discriminator would be able to s distinguish between them. So this is called adversarial training, and it has been very successful. I want to highlight two previous results from other teams. The first one is PsychoGAN. So PsychoGAN used adversarial training um, to do high-resolution image mapping between domains without supervision. So what this um, approach did, for example, it took many images of horses and of zebras without correspondences between the two, as if you could get any. Um, and then it learned an unsupervised technique that could map between an image of a horse and the um, analogous image of a zebra, mainly just by changing the texture and adding stripes. Um, and this was done in an unsupervised way at pretty high resolutions. Another approach is um, DiscoGAN. Uh, DiscoGAN was able to find more semantic analogies, although at lower resolutions. So what he was able to do is take many images of bags and many other images of shoes and then be able to um, map in an unsupervised way between a bag and an analogous shoe and vice versa. Um, we've also done some work um, on finding adversarial analogies between very different domains. Um, so the work, um, this is joint work with um, Leo Wolf. Uh, it was presented in CVPR. And so what we did is we presented the first unsupervised work to match between text and images. Uh, so the input were two sets of data. The first one was a set of sentences describing birds. And the other set was a set of images containing birds. And the objective was to learn a function that could match between those sentences and the images. Um, <laughs> Although it might not sound natural that we could, just without any, more supervi without any supervision, match between images and text, in fact, our method was able to do it by matching distributions. And so this worked both for um, birds and for flowers, and we could match between text and images in an unsupervised way. So um, these techniques obviously work um, quite well for some cases, and they've really dominated the field of unsupervised analogies um, at least for the last two years, whereas beforehand things didn't really work so well. Um, however, over these two years, some major limitations of these methods were found. The first one is difficult training. It is quite difficult to find um, a good optimum uh, for, adversarial, um, for adversarial methods. Um, this is research in progress. There are many teams working on it. There's been a lot of progress on this, but this is not solved. Um, the other problem is mode collapse. That is to say that adversarial methods are able to m map only some parts of the distribution, but not all of it. For example, if we take a look at the uh, figure at the bottom, we can see that by the end of training, the A, the a domain was mapped into a part of the B domain, but not into all of it. This would be an illustration of mode dropping. The other issue is slow training, which I will elaborate on a little bit later. Um, so the the um, first um, work that I wanted to speak about is unsupervised word translation. So this is joint work with Leo Wolf, and it was presented in EMNOP a few weeks ago. Um, so the task is, given languages A and B, uh, we want to find a transformation such that for every word in one of the languages, the transformed word in, um, would have the same language in, with the same meaning in the other language as the original word had in the uh, source language. So this is not a new task. Um, it's been around for at least centuries, probably longer. Um, the first um, attempts use parallel uh, text between the two languages. So they would have parallel text between the two languages. They would force align them in some way and get a dictionary from that. And one example of, um, of a method like that is using the Rosetta Stone to find um, unsupervised analogies between languages. Um, more recent um, work tried to do it for 
a non-parallel text corpora. So some um, previous work used co-occurrence and context, um, and other work used uh, various heuristics, such as finding identical matching strings, using frequency of words, and using synonymous words. So we don't use these heuristics in this work. Um, over the past year, some um, really amazing progress was made using adversarial methods um, for, for doing this kind of unsupervised translation. So we do not use adversarial methods, and we show that um, our method works um, better. Okay, so as so just um, f and just for introduction, I first introduce uh, word to vec. So this is work by Mikolov in 2013, and the idea is to represent every word, which is obviously discrete, as a 300-dimensional continuous vector, which would preserve semantic meanings of the word. Um, so the main idea um, behind word to vec is that we want vectors of frequently co-occurring um, words to have. Um, we want these word vectors to sit closer together, and we want rarely co-occurring words to be more distant. So, for example, um, we would go through very large tax corpora, and if we would see the sentence, the cat sat on the mat, then we would want the vector for cat and for sat to be closer than maybe the vectors for, like, cat and PhDs, which would co-occur a little bit less. So now that we have found those good representations for words, um, now uh, what um, Mikolov was able to find is that when they computed word vec for two different languages independently, and then they used a supervised dictionary to learn a supervised um, to learn a mapping between the two languages, basically a translation function, they found that very simple translation functions do a surprisingly good job. In fact, just an orthogonal matrix is able to translate very accurately between European languages. So this means that the transformation that we're looking for is really quite simple. Um, so to get some intuition for our method, let's first review um, 3D point cloud matching. Can you go back to one slide, please? Can you explain what we see in the right-hand side? Um, at the bottom. Um, so basically, these are two-dimensional embeddings. This is just an illustration. Um, the embeddings are 300-dimensional. These are two-dimensional embeddings um, of a few related words. Um, between uh, just names of numbers between two different languages. And um, the idea is that um, even though the, um, the representations might, uh, might be different, um, it's a fairly simple transformation between one and the other one. They would preserve a lot of, they would, might preserve uh, distances or at least relative distances between um, the two languages. So th that is, um, so that makes us think that the, um, transformation between the two languages is fairly simple. It's not necessarily a big nonlinear neural net. But is, is this just an illustration, or is data that came out of a two-dimensional embedding algorithm? Um, so this is taken from Mikolov's paper. I don't know exactly um, how, how they uh, computed it. I assume that they projected it um, to two dimensions using, um, using some uh, reduction. I think it actually came from their paper, but it actually yeah, came from the method. The line somehow, because otherwise there, there is no even a Yes. I, I assume that this is after the uh, translation stage. Um, so, um, so to get some uh, intuition, so let's first review 3D point cloud matching. Um, the idea behind, so the task of 3D point cloud matching is that we take two different views of the same object, uh, basically represented as a set of three-dimensional uh, points in space without ordering between them. And the task is to be able to align the two views. That is to put one on top of the other one. Um, so we would need to um, find one of two things. Uh, we could uh, just find the orthogonal transformation that would put one on top of the other one. So that would be sufficient. Or if we had some correspondences between these 3D point clouds, then we could compute this transformation um, and be able to align them. But in this task, we're not given any of these. So we need to um, solve these two tasks jointly in order to solve uh, the alignment problem. Um, so one of the classical algorithms for solving this task is called the ICP, iterative closest point. The idea behind the ICP is fairly simple. Basically, they initialize the translation function using uh, some initialization, uh, which I'll talk about later. Um, they use that to um, translate one point cloud on top of the other one. Now, for each, um, each point in um, the target cloud, um, we try to find the nearest uh, projected point from the other cloud. 
and we denote, we take these nearest neighbors are denoted as approximate correspondences. So now that we have these approximate correspondences, we can use them to find, uh, to uh, compute a better translation function between the two clouds. Now that we have a better translation function, we can use them to project um, the source cloud to the target cloud again, find correspondences again, and to a convergence. Um, so ICP um, works quite well if we have a good initialization. Um, the way that we could get a good initialization is, for example, if we assume that the transformations are not large, then the identity um, initialization would be sufficient. However, for um, very large, um, for very large transformations, um, ICP might not actually work very well because of initialization. So we can easily see the analogy between um, point cloud matching and word translation. If we represented each um, word as um, a point in the cloud, so we had a w each language was a word cloud, um, then um, we could first map each word in one language to the other one using some pre-initialized translation function, find, uh, induce a dictionary by, ta by finding the nearest neighbor for every word in the target language. Now that we have the, this approximate dictionary, we can use this to refine our translation function and then um, repeat that until convergence. Um, so although this might sound like a, a natural thing to try, um, this doesn't really work. Um, and there's a few reasons for that. Um, so the first one is that the extension from three dimensions to 300 dimensions is really not uh, trivial. Um, also, different languages are not really the two different views of the same object. Um, they do have some fairly different properties. Although Mikulov did show that an orthogonal transformation can find, can find a decent translation, they're not exactly the same object. Um, now, although in, in point cloud matching, we can, at least in some cases, assume that the transformation is small, um, this is never a good assumption for languages. Uh, there's no reason why they would be um, um, just a small translation function away. And also the um, mapping matrix is about four orders, orders of magnitude larger, so obviously this will be um, more challenging. Um, so we um, proposed a new method, which is called mini-batch um, ICP, um, which presents a few technical novelties to actually make this work. Um, so I'm just going to present one of them, um, and that's the, um, I guess, the most uh, critical stage, which is initialization. Um, so how do we initialize this properly? Um, so we use the observation, which is also sometimes used in point cloud matching, um, that um, although different, ob different views might not be aligned, if we um, compute the principal axes of each one of those views, um, then they should probably, um, uh, if we align both of these views to principal axes, now they should actually be um, aligned. So we can compute principal axes using PCA, align everything to principal vectors, and we hope that everything will be aligned. Now this isn't exactly true for two reasons. The first one is that this is only true up to a sign flip, right? And that would completely um, destroy the alignment. And the other issue is that this is only true for non-degenerate principal axes. Once we have degeneracies, this is only true up to uh, rotations, and that is not actually going to uh, be sufficient. Um, so um, to combat the degeneracy problem, what we do is we uh, reduce the dimensionality um, to just uh, 50 or 25 dimensions, and that uh, removes most of the degeneracy problem because the um, largest principal axes are usually less degenerate. Sure. What do you mean by degeneracy? Degeneracy is when uh, two eigenvalues have the same value. Um, so now um, we can rotate them. We can rotate the eigenvectors in different ways, and you know all of them would be valid principal axes, but they wouldn't necessarily be aligned. Um, it happens quite often um, in the lower, um, so at, because at, at some point it's just mainly, your principal axes are mainly just noise, and the values tend to be fairly close. Uh, so I think it actually does tend to be um, quite common at the lower, um, at small values, but it doesn't happen so often at the larger values. Why do you think? Because of accuracy. Like because of accuracy. Because yeah. I didn't understand the, your comment about the generosity. There could be, uh, called degeneracies or uh, really it's, uh, invariant subspaces as opposed to invariant directions uh, that are still that still have large singular values that are not in the noise. Uh, the other thing which which you refer to is the matrix is close to being low rank. So the rank is not really 300, but the rank is maybe 
50 and then if you project down to the first 50 directions, but then depending on whether in those 50 large singular values, whether they're really distinct or whether they're repeated singular values among the large ones. Sure. Uh, so I think at least empirically um, we find that there is still some degeneracy at even the larger singular values, but we found that to be a little bit less common that in, than in the noise uh, values, which, which is not surprising. Um, so both combining this and the sign flip problem, it is not actually sufficient just to compute PCA and take the top values. We actually need to do something else, which I will get into in the next slide. <coughs> um, so um, what our method um, did is we, we actually computed, um, so we computed multiple solutions. We, we run this multiple times with a randomized PCA algorithm, which every time would find so slightly different principal axes, um, both in terms of um, signs, but also in terms of um, ordering of near um, eigenvalues. Um, and so what we found is that if we run multiple solutions, then um, I think for m most languages that we tried, uh, we find one solution um, where things are close enough so that um, the initialization is sufficiently um, good for the method to converge. Now, mind you, it doesn't have to be perfectly initialized. It just has to be good enough for ICP to converge. Um, so um, so we, we obviously we compute the most multiple initializations, and then we run ICP um, and by the, for each one of these runs. But this is an unsupervised problem. If this was supervised, then we could use some validation set to see how good the dictionary is. But this is an unsupervised problem. So we need to find an unsupervised criterion to determine which one of these runs actually did converge. Um, so as opposed to some other problems that uh, we dealt with, uh, for which it was difficult to find such unsupervised criterion, in this case, it was really quite easy. Um, so the way we did it is we, um, <coughs> we just looked at the uh, distance between neighbors um, by the end of training. Um, and this was sufficient. So the lo at the end of the day, the loss function was just sufficient to determine uh, which, which one of these ones uh, converged nicely. Um, with GANs, this is not actually um, sufficient to see if they converge. So if we take a look at the, um, at the figures, um, so at the bottom, we can see the loss functions at the end of training uh, for 500 different runs. And we can see um, that there is a large peak of large loss values. These are runs that did not converge. And then we can see a smaller peaks of significantly lower loss values. These are the runs that converged. So pretty much any statistical significant measure or just taking the minimum after a sufficient number of runs is enough to find a run that did converge. So um, now that we've found a good initialization, so we've found an approximate dictionary between these two languages, now any ICP method would be sufficient. Um, just about everything works. Um, so um, just as maybe an important implementation point, once that we have actually found this good initialization, we do not want to use the lower rank um, vectors that we used before just to get a good initialization. Now we can use the full 300 dimensions. And because we have a good initialization, this is going to converge. Uh, so this is the final algorithm. Um, so we evaluated this approach against uh, both the state-of-the-art GAN method um, and just the fully supervised baseline. And we found that the performance of our method on European languages was pretty similar to the supervised baseline and was significantly better than the GAN baseline, just because it's really difficult to get GANs to converge. Um, so I, I think it's even more interesting to see how this works on non-European languages. Um, so we found that on languages where both our method and the GAN method both converged, our method performed uh, significantly better. Um, now, there were many languages for which the GAN method did not converge, and our, our method did. Uh, for example, Farsi, Hindu, and Bengali. Uh, by the way, just in case you're wondering how it did in Hebrew, so yeah, it performed quite well in Hebrew and significantly better than the GAN method. Um, one um, maybe negative result is that our method could not con converge on Chinese. We don't actually have a good explanation for this, and this is something that we're definitely looking into. Um, it's, it is somewhat curious. Um, so apart from um, the performance, um, the better accuracy and the better convergence, our method is a lot um, faster than the GAN method. So it takes about six minutes on CPUs, whereas the GAN method takes somewhere between 15 minutes and an hour on GPUs. That's mainly because our method doesn't actually use any deep learning. Um, now, our method is parallelizable because all these different initializations can be run on different machines, so it's fast. And it 
uh, as we said, because it doesn't really use any deep learning, it runs really fast on CPU. Sure. Uh, you said you did, you did a unit on descent. Uh, when the method stops, is there a way to, to tell whether it has succeeded or failed? For example, in Chinese, do you know that it failed before you check an actual dictionary? Yes. Um, so the way I evaluate it, um, I, 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 I'm not 100% sure that, I mean, I don't have theoretical justification for it, but I know that empirically it always works, is that I evaluate this distribution. Now, if I see that I have two peaks, I have a strong, um, a strong, large, uh, a strong peak at high loss value and at another peak at lower loss values, then it's nearly always the case that the method uh, did converge. If, on the other hand, I just see a lot of values at around the same value with some uh, noise between them, then this means the method has not converged. Empirically, this works, but obviously this is not theoretically justified. Um, so now we can answer the question of, is deep learning really necessary for word translation? Um, so I, I think at least from these observations, uh, we can conclude that maybe not. Um, and um, those shallow non-adversarial methods actually have um, significant advantages, such as um, we have higher, uh, higher accuracy. And the reason for that is because our loss functions are so much easier to optimize, um, we actually get better optima. Um, and also our method is a lot faster because we don't have deep networks. There isn't a deep discriminator. So it runs really fast and on a CPU. So we haven't actually um, done a deep analysis of the linguistic um, aspects of the words. Uh, just generally, because this is more of a, uh, this, I, I guess this was interesting to a more like machine learning community, which was more interested in let's take the top X words and let's see how good the translation is. I think that these sorts of methods can actually uh, benefit a lot from having linguists taking a look at them and like trying to um, maybe um, find you know, like words that would be better for this unsupervised translation. Maybe on some words it's not, it doesn't really make so much sense to even use them, and some words that um, make more sense for this unsupervised translation. So the short answer is we haven't done any analysis like this, but I think this would be something that we should do. Oh, so So, so I, it maybe it would be a very interesting baseline just to maybe take out the top 100 <coughs> words and then work like you know from 101 to the top 5,000. I assume this might work better. We we haven't done it. Um, it would be very easy to try though. Um, so in the um, previous part of the talk, um, so I I described uh, how we can find unsupervised um, analogies between words. And as we showed, this is not such a difficult task. You can even use non-deep methods to do it, and it works fine. Um, in the next part of the talk, I'm going to describe how we compute and supervise analogies between images. And this is a little bit more challenging. Um, so just to, um, to understand our method, um, I'm first going to briefly um, overview our deep, generative, uh, g deep image generation models. Um, and I'll show some uh, work that we did in this space, and then I'll, I'll, um, I'll go into um, unsupervised image analogies. So an image generation model, uh, at least in this context, is just a function that takes in a latent code or just a vector of fixed size with arbitrary numbers and generates an image from these arbitrary numbers. Um, now, different latent codes give different images. Um, and we, can, we typically are going to sample this latent code from some uh, predetermined distribution. Um, there are many such distributions. Uh, we, it, could be, um, it could be a big Euclidean space. It could lie on a sphere. There are many distributions we could, um, uh, we could sample it from. Um, so what makes a good generative image model, though? So we, we actually want um, a couple of things. So um, the first one is that it needs to uh, generate nice, realistic images. So that, that would be a major requirement. 
Um, now, also, we want um, the generated image distribution to be quite close to the real image distribution. There are some properties that this would need to satisfy. Um, so it needs to be sufficient for us. For every um, possible real image uh, from that distribution, we need to have a latent code so that we could, um, when we pass it through the generator, we will actually be able to reconstruct that image. And also, this needs to be compact. That is to say, for every valid latent code, if we pass it through the generator, it needs to give us a valid image. So the current state of the art in um, generative image models um, is, is held by GANs, Generative Adversarial Networks, which are very similar to what I described before. Um, so GANs are able to generate very realistic uh, looking images, um, but they do have some major disadvantages, um, such as, as we said, the training is, is quite challenging. Um, and also they suffer from mode dropping, that is to say they'll only, only give some parts of the image distribution, but not all of it. Um, now, um, the I guess the most um, significant um, method currently for training non-adversarial um, image generative models is VAE. Um, now, VAE um, has pretty stable training and doesn't suffer from mode dropping. Um, however, it does generate pretty blurry images. So if we look at the bottom, we can see that they're not really competitive. Um, so I, I want to review two methods before I actually get to our method. Um, so the first one is called um, GLOW, Generative Latent Optimization. Um, this is a work from Facebook, was presented in ICML this year. Um, so GLOW basically has the same motivation as classical decomposition methods, such as uh, SVD. So one way of looking at SVD um, is uh, we just take a set of uh, signals, a set of samples of um, maybe some higher dimension. And what we want to do is to represent them as two things. One is a shared matrix. Um, which and the other one is a uh, is a smaller vector is a latent code that when we multiply the matrix by this latent code we recover the um, the original samples as closely as possible using some metric um, so there's obviously many different ways for both training these methods and many constraints that we can put in them but they're generally not very good at modeling high resolution images now um, what glow tries to do is it tries to do similar things for images um, and the way it does it is that it replaces this linear, linear matrix by a deep convolutional neural net. So it basically decomposes this set of images into uh, both a set of latent codes, one per image, and also a shared generator. Now, if we, um, if we operate the generator on each one of these latent codes, we're trying to uh, recover the training images. Um, so let's um, examine some properties of GLOW. Um, so the first one is um, GLOW is very good at uh, reconstructing the training set. So if we use each one of the latent codes use, uh, found in training, we pass it through the generator, we will reconstruct the training images very closely. These are generated images. Um, on the other hand, GLOW isn't so good at um, reconstructing. How much smaller is the representation than the compressed images in the training set? So it, it is, it's significantly smaller. Um, I think this is from 100 dimensions, maybe. And those images are, I think, 256 by 256. Um, well, I understand the big. So what's 100? The size of the code? The 100 would be the size of the code, and the resolution would be 256. If you think the code into, into a black box, the code has the original images embedded in it. So you just have to search for the images that correspond to the code, and you recover the image. Oh, we, we're helping it even more. The, the, mm -hmm. the representation inside the black box is really much smaller than the, the, the uh, compressed image. I, I, I mean, bas I, if I understand um, your comment correctly, basically what you're saying is that maybe it's memorizing everything, and it has so many weights that it can memorize everything. OK, so I, I'm, I'm going to talk about that. Um, the other issue, which um, relates to what you're saying, is if we give it um, just randomly generated latent codes, we pass it through the generator, we get uh, reconstruction, we get generations that are not so good. Um, so maybe we would say that GLOW is completely overfitting, but that's not the entire story. Um, because if we take two latent codes from the training set and we linearly interpolate between them, then we get very sensible interpolations. For example, um, we just interpolated the latent codes between this person and this person, and they vary quite smoothly. Um, even though those specific interpolations were not seen in the training set. Um, so it is generating a good latent space. It does preserve linear relationships, but the space is not compact. 
Okay, so another method I wanted to review is um, implicit maximum likelihood estimation, IMLE. Um, this is previous work by uh, Lee and Malik. Um, so what this approach um, attempts to do is it um, first generates random latent codes. It passes them through the generator uh, to, get, uh, to um, obtain generated images. Now for every image in the training set, it tries to find um, the nearest um, generated image in some metric. They actually use the Euclidean metric. Um, now that we've found those correspondences, <coughs> in very similarly to uh, ICP, um, they now try to refine the generator. And then they generate new latent codes, they pass them through the generator, find new correspondences, and further refine the generator. By the end of training, um, the, um, the, uh, what the generator is able to do is it's able to uh, reconstruct the training distribution quite closely. Um, so it obviously has no mode collapse. Oh, so let's look at the properties of IMLE. So IMLE fills up the latent space uh, very well because it samples from the entire latent distribution because it randomly samples codes. Um, there is no mode dropping um, because it's basically just trained to, um, um, to be able to reconstruct the entire training distribution. So there is no mode dropping. Um, however, it is very sensitive to the metric used. This is the same as any other nearest neighbors method. It's very sensitive to the metric, and Euclidean metrics generally are not very good for images. Um, so it results in very blurry uh, generated images. So if we compare GAN generated images to IMLE uh, generated images, um, they're not really competitive. They're really quite blurry. Um, so we propose a new approach, which is called Generative Latent Nearest Neighbors, or GLAN. Um, now, GLAN basically combines the advantages of both of these methods. Um, so we first take the training images and we decompose them into latent codes and the generator. Um, so as we said, uh, this gives us both a good generator and a good latent space that preserves linear relationships. So the Euclidean metric would probably be pretty good for latent codes. Um, however, as we said, the latent, the late, this, latent, uh, this generator is not compact with respect to the latent uh, space. If we randomly generate latent codes, this will not give us good generations. Now, we map from a noise distribution, say some high dimensional uh, normal distribution, um, to the latent code distribution obtained in uh, the previous stage. So now we are able to generate, from noise, we are able to generate new latent codes that correspond to the same distribution as uh, the latent codes uh, for those images. Now, the reason why IMLE would actually work in this case is because the latent space is, um, is, is a lot more semantic and it preserves linear relationships, which means that Euclidean, um, the Euclidean metric actually works in this space. So a single forward run uh, of generated in, uh, generating an image using our method uh, first samples a noise vector, then we map it into a latent code using the IMLE train generator. Then we use this latent code, we map it through the glow train generator to generate an image. Um, so just uh, in terms of like a simple MNIST uh, evaluation um, for a bunch of different methods. So we can see that IMLE generates blurry images, glow generates uh, images that are actually quite sharp, but they seem to be interpolations of a bunch of digits and seem very realistic. Now both GAN and GLAN seem to generate um, digits that are of pretty high um, quality. And they're all fairly similar to the uh, real digits. Um, so we also did a numerical um, evaluation. Um, so we basically took the evaluation by Lucy Chitao, who took uh, seven different GANs and uh, one VAE. They evaluated each one of them on 100 different hyperparameter configurations, just because GANs are so difficult to train. And they picked the best one. Um, and they, they evaluated them on four different data sets. Um, and just to summarize, um, our method was better than all the non all the non adversarial methods, better than GLOW and VAE, um, and it was uh, significantly better than um, all the GAN methods on two of the data sets. On two other data sets, it was comparable to the best of these methods. That's to say, it was a little worse than the best one and better than most of the other one. Um, so just to see. Um, a few results at higher resolutions. Um, so the way we generated these results was we first randomly sampled um, latent codes, um, both for the right-hand side images and the left-hand side images. And then we linearly interpolated between them in noise space, and we generated each one of these interpolations. Um, now, um, 
ba so basically what we can see is that um, all the generations look really realistic. Um, but I think what's more interesting in terms of evaluating how, um, how much overfitting we're doing or not doing is that uh, we seem to be able to, um, um, to interpolate uh, to find that all the points in the middle are also uh, valid points. So the generator is not memorizing them. There are always interpolation between two points? Between two points, but both of these points are also randomly generated. So these are not real images. Um, all of these images are generated. Um, these are just interpolations of them. Um, and I, I particularly like this result because it's interpolating between two people that look very different um, in a fairly semantic way. Um, now, also one of the highlights of uh, GANs is that they can generate very high-resolution images. Um, so, um, so one of the approaches, a progressive growing of GANs, was able to go up to 1,024 by 1,024 pixels. So we can do that too. Yeah, it works. Um, okay, so now that we have a non-adversarial generative model of images, now we can get back to our original problem of finding unsupervised image analogies. Um, so just to uh, remind you, basically the task is uh, given two image sets from domains A and B, um, we want to map every image from the first domain to a new image such that it preserves the um, original semantic content, but it looks as if it comes from the other domain. For example, in this case, we want to be able, in an unsupervised way, to map between those edge maps um, to um, images, to photorealistic images of shoes that preserve the same edge map. Oh, by the way, I didn't give credit beforehand. That was joint work with uh, Jitendra Malik. Um, and this work is, um, is joint work with uh, Leo Wolf. It was presented in ECCV just a few months ago. Um, so just as a warm-up, um, let's review um, how this would work if we had exact analogies. That is to say that we had, for every um, training image in the B domain, we had an exact analogy in the A domain. We just don't know the correspondences a priori. Um, so one um, really inefficient way of solving it would be to try every single permutation of, uh, of correspondences between the two domains. So obviously this is hard and this is not a good method, but it's just an, illust uh, an illustration of how we could solve this. Um, and then for each one of these permutations, we could train a supervised regression between the A domain and the B domain. And the assumption is that the, um, the correct correspondence would have the lowest loss function. It would be, the easy, it would be easiest to fit the mapping between the correct correspondences. So we, we would just pick that one, and this would give us both the best mapping and the best correspondence. Um, so we actually, um, so jointly with uh, Leo Wolf in iClear, we uh, presented a solution that can do this efficiently. This is not MP-hard. Our, our solution is much more efficient. Um, in, in this work, however, we do not make the assumption that we have exact matches between the training sets of the A domain and the B domain. Um, we, we might not have any correspondences at all. Um, so NAM takes in two inputs. The first one is a generative model of the A domain. That is, as we described before, it's just a model that is able to uh, generate every image in the A domain and no other image. And we don't care how this was trained, but it needs to be trained using some other method. Uh, GLAN would be a great choice. Um, the other input that we take in is a, B domain training, is a set of B domain training images. So our approach, NAM, um, is a matching-based domain alignment method. Um, so the way um, this, so we, we have a good model for the A domain now. This is the pre-trained generative model. And so the way NAM works is we try to uh, train a mapping so that for every training image in the B domain, um, we, we, we look through the A domain. We try to find the best correspondence in the A domain generative model. And then we map it to the B domain so that it reconstructs the training image as closely as possible. So we optimize both over, over the latent codes, searching over the, um, the A domain, as well as the mapping function. Um, so let's um, go through one forward step of this approach. Um, so, for a, so for every uh, B domain training image Y, um, we have a special latent code. Um, so that when we pass it through the generator, we get an A domain image. And then we also, at the same time, also train a um, mapping function between A and B. And our objective is to reconstruct the training image as closely as possible. And obviously, we do it for all the training images. Um, so we optimize over two different sets of parameters. The first um, is a set of latent codes. 
Um, basically, this is just searching through the space of A-domain images, trying to find the best correspondence for each B-domain training image. So this is a big set of latent codes. And the other thing that we optimize is the parameters of the mapping function. It's just one mapping function that maps from the A-domain to the B-domain. And this is all trained using a reconstruction criterion. Um, now, we do use a perceptual metric, and um, th there's a few other things like that. But that's basically the optimization. Um, so by the end of training, um, we now have a mapping function that it can take us from the A domain to the B domain. However, the mapping function is usually not of high enough quality to actually map from an original A domain image to the B domain image. Instead, to get analogies um, for a new, um, for some evaluation uh, B domain image, we would try to optimize over the latent codes, basically search through the A domain so that um, we would find an image that would map well to this B domain image. So this was, would give us, so now that we have this optimal latent code, we pass it through the generator, and now we get the A domain analogy for this B domain image. Now, this is only a single solution. However, if we optimize, um, if we solve this optimization multiple times with different initializations, we end up finding different solutions. This is because this is a highly non-convex problem, um, and it should be a non-convex problem because there are multiple solutions that lead into the same one. It does have multiple solutions. Um, so just to get a general feeling, maybe one in, every, uh, one in every two runs gives us a different solution. So you don't need like many, many, many different runs. Just a few runs would give you many solutions. Uh, so how is our method, how is NAM different from um, GAN-based method, adversarial methods? Um, so obviously we don't use adversarial training, but um, apart from that, um, so one thing is that our generative model is not trained as a part of mapping. It is pre-trained which is good because we can use state-of-the-art methods to train these generative models, and this generally yields much higher quality analogies. Also, our transformation function is not one-to-one. -one. We are able to get multiple analogies for the same input image. I'll show what this means a little bit later. Um, something else is that uh, we don't actually rely on having a strong mapping function, M. We only use M to find correspondences, but once that we have found them, we just need to pass the latent code through the generator to get the actual analogy. So M doesn't have to be particularly photorealistic, meaning that it can be a much smaller function, which means that um, we can have much lower sample complexity. So let's take a look at a few qualitative results. I actually have um, quite a few qualitative results in the paper, but I'm not uh, going to present them today. Um, so just for an illustration, so um, this task is mapping between edges of shoes to photorealistic shoes. Again, completely unsupervised. Um, and these are uh, results both by NAM and DiscoGAN. Um, and I think most of us would agree that the analogies made by NAM are of uh, both higher quality and higher fidelity um, than those made by DiscoGAN, which is the competing approach at this resolution. Um, as we said, um, NAM is able to give multiple um, analogies for the same input image. So um, here are results for two input shoes, and we can see um, that these analogies are generally um, fairly good. Um, and they also have quite a lot of diversity between them, which is something that DiscoGAN would not be able to do. Uh, I'm not sure I understand how you make the comparison to <laughs> other methods. Uh, you said that uh, this method is not solves the non-convex uh, problem. It's randomized. I assume that some of these some of these properties also hold for the competitor methods. So if you run it longer, for example, or maybe like my previous code, if you give it more memory, you do better. So I, I, when you make these comparisons, they're qualitative or quantitative, do you, do you have to make sure that they get the same running time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the GAN-based methods take much longer. So in terms of running time, they're definitely getting a lot more. Um, in terms of um, capacity of generators, so we use exactly the same generator. And we don't use a, a discriminator, so we actually use fewer parameters. Um, in terms of giving them long, we could give them longer to run, but uh, I mean, we, they already have long enough and much longer than our method. Um, so uh, again, uh, we can, it's, it's difficult to get a comparison that's 100% correct, but we have tried to make it as fair as possible. Also, as, as, as we said, I mean, these are qualitative comparisons. I mean, 
Obviously, there are much larger data sets than this. Uh, but we've also done qu um, quantitative comparisons, for example, translating between one type of digit to another one, say from SVHN to MNIST, and then we would uh, run a, a classifier on trained on the other domain just to see um, how closely to that domain, uh, how much it preserved the same content. But, and again, we do better on these metrics as well. Um, so I, I think we, we try to make these comparisons as, as fairly as possible. Um, okay, so another example, um, and I think it was one of the early successes, and this is work by uh, Yaniv Teigman et al., and Lior is um, also an author on that, um, is, um, so basically they tried to find an unsupervised mapping between faces and emojis, um, which is important, obviously, because um, supervision does not occur naturally. Um, and so um, their approach, DTN, um, was um, really successful at mapping between faces and emojis, which is a transformation that loses information. Um, however, it was um, less successful at mapping between um, emojis and faces because that involves adding information, which was um, apparently more challenging. Um, so I'm just showing a few um, results from NAM. NAM uh, could actually map between emojis to faces quite successfully. Um, basically, all we needed to do is replace the generator by a high-quality generative model of faces, and we can see that we could map between avatars and very high-resolution facial images in an unsupervised way. So this is at 1024 by 1024 resolution, um, and the avatars which we used, the input avatars are about 64 by 64. This sort of thing is uh, pretty difficult for GANs, um, but uh, seems to be quite easy for NAM. Um, so if we want to take this a little bit further, we replaced, uh, now we try to compute analogies between avatars and dog images. Now, obviously, humans <coughs> do not look like dogs, so there is no ground truth. Um, but we just wanted to show that our method can find analogies between very different and probably not very highly related domains. Um, so in terms of um, why I think analogies are particularly important um, for uh, artificial intelligence right now, um, so one, one specific um, interesting application is that currently um, deep reinforced learning um, achieves really strong results in simulation. Um, however, when we actually try to apply these techniques to uh, robots, um, they tend to be less successful, and the reason is sample complexity. We need to generate many examples, and robots move quite slowly, so it's difficult to get them to try enough examples. So one approach that um, many researchers in the field believe in is uh, trying to train in simulation and transfer to the real world. But there are some so model-based approaches, both for planning and for policy learning, um, but there are some issues with that. Um, the, the two issues, I mean, the first one is that the models that um, we, we use um, are usually a fairly imperfect representation of the world. And so the policy that we might uh, learn in these models um, might not transfer very well to the real world. Um, so I think that these approaches could be useful in two different ways. Um, the first one is that I think adversarial methods are currently holding us back from training high-quality generative models. And I believe that non-adversarial techniques like that, which are so much easier to train, and we can use massive capacity on them, um, would actually be able to give us much more realistic models. Um, but we might, this might still be capped. We might never be able to train models that are of high enough quality to be exactly the same as the real world. Um, so the other thing that we might want to do is we want to be able to transfer between very imperfect models and the real world and so this is, an this is an analogy problem. And I believe that some of these techniques, and obviously many of the techniques uh, developed by other groups, would be the way forward um, to overcome uh, this task. Another research problem that I'm uh, very interested in pursuing, um, it's um, only vaguely related to analogies, um, is being able to learn agent interactions from predicting what the agents do. Um, so, like more concretely, um, can neural networks learn laws from observing, um, from observing motion? If we predict what the agents would do, can we understand what laws govern their motion, um, govern their interaction? And so this can be interesting in many contexts. This could be interesting um, in terms of learning physical laws from observing nature. Um, this might be an easier place to start because we kind of understand physical laws. Um, but then we can extend this to understanding social laws by observing how social agents interact. Maybe we could infer language by um, hearing what people say, seeing uh, what they do, um, out of predicting what they will do next. We might be able to understand what the messages that they convey mean. And um, on a more speculative uh, note, 
uh, perhaps by um, observing what animals, um, what uh, sounds they make, and by, by what motions they also make, and by predicting what they will do next, would we be able to understand the nature of their communications? Um, so I've done some preliminary uh, work on this um, in a NIPS paper about a year ago, um, which was able, just by, ob by, just by predictive modeling, it was able to understand the nature of interaction between uh, soccer players, uh, between uh, systems of bouncing balls, between, um, uh, between chess pieces. Uh, but I don't think this has even scratched the surface. And I, I think this is um, quite an exciting direction, which I'm also interested in pursuing. Um, so all the papers I discussed today are in this list. Um, and thank you very much for listening. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions.